Welcome to Rev Reads. I'm Sean Wilson, and I have the distinct privilege today of talking to Dr. Corey Marsh, who is a New Testament professor at Southern California Seminary. He is also one of the pastors at Revolve Church. Did I get the church name right? Scholar in residence at Revolve Bible Church. Scholar in residence. I don't know if I've heard of a scholar in residence before, but I like the title. Right. I wish I could tell you what it means. I'm kind of learning as I go, but uh, sort of being a bridge between the church and the academy. It's been real fun at RBC. Yeah. So we are here to talk to Dr. Marsh about his latest book, A Primer on Biblical Literacy. And it's funny, I I said in my review that I, I loved Corey's book so much that I read it and I was like, I want to do a series on this at my church. And just last Sunday, I announced in my church, we're going to do a six-week series this summer on a primer in biblical literacy, I told people about the review and Dr. Marsh's book. And somebody in my church was taking notes and they wrote down that the series was going to be on biblical literacy. They called me about a half an hour ago and they said, I was taking notes and I wrote down that it was on biblical what? And I was like, biblical literacy. And she goes, oh, I wrote that. And I just assumed that that could not have been the topic because I've (laughs) never heard of biblical literacy before. There you go. Okay. (laughs) And she's someone who's been in the church, you know, for decades. She is is so faithful in studying the, the Bible. And so that leads to the question then, Dr. Marsh. Mm-hmm. Why write a book on biblical literacy when pretty much nobody's heard of it? <laughs> Excellent question, and I appreciate that personal example right there. Uh, this ch- this book had its birth in the local church, my own local church, for example, a Revolved Bible Church. Uh, we were we had a team come in from IBL Institute for Biblical Leadership to help us out with crafting. Oh, a new mission statement, vision statement, what's the goals of our church, some leadership dynamics, all those wonderful leadership type strategies. And throughout that intensive, it was like three or four or five days, and they came out on several trips. Um, throughout that process, we realized, you know, one of, one of the distinctives we want to have at our church is to, be, is to make sure that people know we are faithfully committed. I'm trying to think of how exactly it was, it was worded. Faithfully committed to biblical literacy. And everybody was like, yes, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> and then it came out, then immediately after, just like the, the lady that came to you was like, well, what does that even mean? <laughs> Biblical literacy, right? Um, come to find out, yeah, it's, it's not defined. Hardly ever is it defined. It's not really re- addressed. Um, this is something I, I bring up in the book in chapter two. Uh, I was asked by the leadership team, our, our pastors and elders, and, and asked if I would mind, if I would mind writing something defining biblical literacy um, because it sounds so it sounds it sounds it, it, it resonates with the people sort of intuitively we know what that means we know what literacy and, and illiteracy might mean we can read or can't read but brought to the bible what exactly does that mean and so i set out to write a very short blog is what it was going to be but my first problem i ran into when i'm kind of gathering my sources as as people do when they're researching not too many people have addressed it, and it's not something that's defined. It's a term that's often used in evangelical churches, but not really explained. And so I ran into my first hurdle right there, just defining biblical literacy. What do I mean by that? What do we mean by it as a church? The more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, biblical literacy is the greater goal to what hermeneutics, and hermeneutics being the interpretation, uh, art and science of interpreting scripture, or any literature really, but in our, our context, biblical hermeneutics, so the art and science of interpreting scripture, that hermeneutics interpre- interpretation, interpretive method, it leads to a bigger goal of becoming literate in the Bible, understanding scripture. And even more so than that, it's understanding the God of scripture. And so this is the way I was thinking about it. It was just kind of expanding, becoming bigger and bigger. I said, you know, at the at the end of the at the end of the day, the ultimate goal to know scripture is to know God. And to know God is to know his word, to know the word is to know God, and a Christian's relationship with with God is directly proportionate with the relationship to scripture. And so I, the way I define biblical literacy in the book is by two key terms, awareness and proficiency. Those things kept kind of you know, batting back and forth in my mind. And I realized, you know, it's not reading the scriptures just to know scripture and that's it. It's gaining awareness of the God of scripture, becoming more intimate with him through 
how he's revealed himself in scripture. And so the, the awareness, growing an awareness of God by becoming more proficient in understanding scripture's meaning. And so I take those two concepts, gaining awareness of God and becoming proficient in how he revealed himself in the scriptures, and I tease that out throughout the book. Um, that is how I'm defining biblical literacy. And, you know, like, like I said earlier, and I have in the beginning of the book, the, the goal, I'm very clear on what this book is intended to do and what it's not intended to do. Um, you know, in my research, I, some of the stats were just alarming. You know, for example, 80% of American Christians uh, cannot name one of the four Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they, don't, they can't name one of them. Um, and some of these stats are even overlapping with evangelicalism. And evangelicals have historically been, you know, are birthed and tied around this high view of scripture of, and inerrancy and inspiration. And the stats are, quite frankly, pathetic. Um, you know, 12% of evangelicals surveyed believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. You know, these types of things. Or believe that, you know, cle you know cleanliness is next to godliness or God helps those who help them. All these platitudes we've come up with in our society and impose them on this idea they come from the scriptures and they don't and so these 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 stats are just so alarming and so i say in the beginning what the book's not intended to do it's not intended to shame anybody into reading more of their bibles and it's certainly not intended to be this comprehensive textbook on hermeneutics um, in fact at the end of the book i, I give personal recommendations for resources on hermeneutics and Bible surveys and concordances and dictionaries, all those, and handbooks, all those wonderful tools, I give a little, I give personal recommendations for ones that have helped me in my teaching. What I'm trying to do, what the book does try to do, is whet the appetite for people to want to know God more by reading His Scriptures, to be less intimidated by start, you know, with starting of reading the Scriptures, uh, to understand that God has revealed Himself, and the Bible is the written revelation of God, and therefore we can and should understand the Scriptures. Um, there will always be challenges. There will always be tensions in the Bible, um, and that's okay. Not to be afraid of them. But the main ideas, the main plot, you know, plots, uh, stories, and plot lines of the story, if you will, say in the Gospels or. The main idea of sin separating us from us and God and God sending his son to die for the sins of the world, these types of things, anybody can understand them if you, yeah. can, if you know how to read. Yeah. And so that's where I want to start. I want to start with let's just be excited about growing closer to God, growing in our awareness of his presence through his word. And we do that by actually interpreting his word. And so in chapter one, it's a three part, three, three chapter book, very simple. Uh, the first chapel, the chapter just sets out why it's even important to become biblically literate. Um, and I give some horrific, dreadful examples of those who are not, such as the extreme cults. Um, and we can, I mean, if I had more time and more space in the book, we can continue just naming names and, and moving down the line throughout church history of those who've exploited the scriptures uh, and brought shame on the name of Christ because they're calling themselves Christians. Um, and they all use the Bible as their platform to do it. That's the scary thing. Well, and they all, and, so and, I the, talk good, about and the good point you make is that it's not just that they use the Bible, but, and, and I liked how you brought this out in the book is that it's not just that they're twisting the Bible, but they're working to actively prevent those who are following them from reading the Bible themselves. That's right. That's so right. it's that, that two edged sword. Absolutely. In fact, there's, it's sort of a garden variety of these extreme cultists who take the Bible as their platform that they don't want their followers reading it. Yeah. Or they want their followers only reading portions and to understand a certain way. For example, in my research, so sort of the go-to most, in my, in the way I look at it in modern times, the most horrific cult is the Jim Jones cult. Yeah. People's, uh, uh, People's Temple in Guyana, South America. It's just absolutely horrific what happened there. Well, certain things didn't come to light until I was researching that chapter and things like, you know, Bibles were not allowed on, in the commune. They actually had a library on site, the Jonestown Library. And after this mass suicide, there were over 900 dead bodies, over 300 of them were children. I didn't even talk about the pets and animals that were all, you know, forced to their deaths by taking- They bodies. killed their pets? They did, yes. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, yeah, by drinking Flavor-Aid or, you know, what we say, drink the Kool-Aid, yeah. but this was a cheaper version of Flavor-Aid. Uh, just like Jim Jones was a cheaper version of a biblical prophet. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you even say that, but it, but um, he he totally discouraged bringing script Bibles to the commune to the point where it was against the rules, and he had the only Bible that they knew of. And then after the inventory was done, 
after everything was cleared and they found the Jonestown Library and they cleared all the sites and everything, they realized that, yeah, there actually was. There were 7,000 articles that were, that were confiscated and inventoried. 15 of those 7,000 items happened to be Bibles. So people brought their Bibles with them. They smuggled them in, but they didn't do anything with them. They just, they, they laid in the, in the ground, you know, sort of moldy, but it was almost like there was some awareness, like we need to have God's word, you know. But the tragic thing is they didn't do anything with it. They didn't challenge any of Jones's demonic teaching. They didn't flock to other Christians, other Bible smugglers, if you will, in the commune to be able to be a force against this demonically oppressed, perhaps demonically possessed cult leader and challenge his teachings. So, yeah, there was, and that's just one example, but we can move down the line. These cultists, they did not encourage scripture reading at all with their people. And if they did, there were just small portions and they had to be read a certain way. But I do discuss that a little bit in chapter one. I was wondering if, if as far as examples of why biblical literacy is important, you touch on uh, how Jesus's temptation in the wilderness by Satan is an illustration for why biblical literacy is important. And I wonder if you could speak on that for just a moment on why Jesus's interaction with Satan argues for why we should all be literate in the scriptures. Absolutely. Yeah, you see in Matthew 4, the temptation of Christ with Satan. This is the very first exchange between the Son of God and Satan in the entire New Testament. And of course, we know the stories and, and, and the story of the temptations in Matthew 4. And Jesus is tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, and toward the end of his, we don't know exactly when, but, we're, but it makes sense toward the end or at the end of his temptation, when his human nature is at its weakest point, Satan steps in with his barrage of, of temptations and attacks, and he's using scripture, specifically uh, Psalm, um, one of the Psalms in, in Psalm 90, Psalm 91, around there off the top of my head, it's, it's in that, that, that corpus right there, uh, against Christ and takes it out of context. Uh, to tempt him in various ways. And of course, Jesus responds, and that was the third temptation, but Jesus responds throughout, uh, quoting scripture, specifically in passages in Deuteronomy, in context. And so what we see here, if there was a lesson, there's a couple lessons to, to take from this. One is, it is those that are, it are those that, that are most familiar with scripture that seems to be the biggest enemies to those who are Christians, who are those who are following Christ, who are, who are trying to read their Bibles with sincere intent. It is going to be those who have a quasi knowledge or perhaps the best knowledge, but are unregenerate, who are going to be the biggest adversaries. Yeah. Just like Jesus, uh, Satan was to Jesus. He didn't, he didn't tempt Jesus in any other way except quoting scripture. Um, and uh, using scripture and even referring to the same introductory formula, it is written. Just yeah. as Jesus would say that, Satan would respond back to us saying that, hey, he could do that too. But it really shows that within these two polar opposite beings, the, the weapon used on both sides is the Bible. I mean, it can, be the, it can be the greatest weapon for good, and it can be the greatest weapon for harm, depending on who's using it and how they're using it. There's an enormous lesson there for us to understand we need to know God's word in context. We need to understand its historical context, its grammatical context, uh, the literary context, its theological context. All these things have to be in play for us to understand what is the author's intent. And so I, I say in, this, this, in that beginning chapter, this battle for the Bible, this is nothing new. This goes back to the ancient times. And we can, we, can, we can see that temptation between Jesus and Satan as a battle of the Bible because they're both using scripture. One is using it in context, which of course is Jesus, and one is using it out of context to do massive harm, and that's Satan himself. So you talk in the book about the defining biblical literacy, and I, I love the way you define it. You know, we're aware of God through proficiency in the scripture. So when would you say that because you talk about the difference of like, this isn't a need to have a, a seminary, you know, PhD level knowledge of scripture to get to this point. So when would you say that someone would be cut, hit that level of that you would say is you're proficient at reading the scripture? Like what's the goal that you want people in the church to aim for when they're reading the Bible for proficiency? Yeah, that's a good question because it, it's kind of hard. There, I don't have any quantifying points. Yeah. of you reach this aspect and now you know you're biblically literate it is it really is and this is where it's okay to to admit this and bring this in there is a subjective level to this yeah everybody's journey as a christian growing in the lord is different than the person next to them and i bring this up in the book this is why church fellowship is so important to learn scripture together as a community because when you're actually learning scripture together in church under the faithful exposition of scripture in small groups and discipleship 
you can actually bounce and resonate these ideas off one another to help disciple and sharpen one another in those contexts to get to that point where, yes, I am confident where I think I, I think I got a basic understanding of what authorial intent is. I think I understand context. Let's just start there. The, the lowest rung on the ladder of growing in biblical literacy is just knowing context. Context is everything. I call it the lowest rung on the ladder, but it's also the most important. Yeah. You can't step oh, yeah. past that until you yeah. understand the context of Scripture. And all those cultists that are extreme that we mentioned earlier, all the more subtle ones, which are run rampant in our day, say the, the prosperity gospel people, um, it's context at play. Context is being avoided. Yeah or ripped out of, out of, twisted out of joint, if you will, on both sides, and they have that in common. The biblically literate Christian is going to understand God has revealed himself in, in Scripture, and I don't need a committee, I don't need a pope, I don't need this leader explaining everything to me. I need teachers to help me understand, but at the end of the day, I'm accountable before the Lord, and I have the Holy Spirit in me if I'm a regenerate Christian, and I can actually understand God's Word, appreciating its literary beauty, as well as appreciating its complexities as well. So we're not going to flatline scripture like there's no problems in it at all. There are, there's certainly yeah, tensions, yeah. but we're going to hit them head on with excitement. Um, and so to answer your question, Sean, it's a good one. I, I really don't have, there's no specific, you know, canned, you know, quantifying, you know, uh, rubric for everybody. To, maybe, maybe you can, maybe we can come up with one in our, in our churches when we teach this uh, as a course. Um, but I think, Everybody's different, but growing together as a community is certainly helpful to understand, to, to know, to be able to understand if we are growing in our proficiency and awareness of scripture. No, that's great. No, that was one thing I was hoping you were going to go to is that proficiency is most seen when you're advancing in the various areas that make someone proficient. I think that's a huge sign of proficiency. So like I said, I read your book and it you said you wanted to do it to sort of whet people's appetite so they, they'd want to, you know, study this subject more. And of course, it worked for me because I'm doing a series on it in my church. And it's nice when you're the pastor, you could read a book like this and be like, oh, I'm just going to start a teaching series on it. But if you're at a church and you're, you read this book and you're not a pastor, and I, I do want to make sure I do highlight this before I get to this question, is that one thing about Corey's book that's great and that I really want to emphasize to everybody is that it is this wonderfully length book that is accessible for everybody in the church. Like that's one thing that is great about it is that uh, you don't need to feel like this is a book that was written just for, for clergy pastors, Bible school students, everybody in the church can read this book. So let's say you read this book and you're not a pastor and you say, obviously this is a church wide thing. I don't want people in my church to think that Jonah Ark is Mrs. Noah. Um, how do I, how would you suggest that you, someone helps their church, those, those in their fellowship become biblically literate? Yeah. You know, this, I'm glad you brought up the, the length of the book. Let's just start there. This was intentional. Someone like me. So I, I you know, I'm a new Testament professor. I'm actively engaged in, in scholarship. I, I write and publish technical articles in different journals and those types of things. This type of book was actually more of a challenge for me to write because I want to be able to say everything on something and give, you know, 20 pages of footnotes, <laughs> you know, things like that, you know. Um, so it was hard to be able to retain, to, to, to refrain from that and give just what I think is the meat to, 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 to grow a desire and to sort of, I guess, let those inhibitions drop a little bit where we're afraid to approach the scriptures because it's a very ancient book and it's overwhelming. But, but so it's to sort of let that guard down a little bit, say, it's okay, let's just dive in and understand that this is really God's word and he expects me to understand it at some level, so let's just start. So I purposely did have in mind those at my church. I'm thinking of different saints at Revolve Bible Church while I'm writing yeah. this chapter. I mean, literally, their mind, their face are coming in my mind, much like you as a pastor, Sean, and those of us who preach. And we often do that. We'll, we'll think of people in our church yeah. you know, as our implied audience, if you will. And then I'm also a professor at Southern California Seminary. So I'm thinking of first time students coming in um, that are older, perhaps, that have feel called to seminary, but don't have an academic exposure to the Bible that other students do or other people do. So I'm thinking of first year students as well. And I, I wanted to bridge these two worlds of, of the church and the academy on some very accessible level. So I didn't want to dumb it down or also I'm, I'm talking down to people in this. I wanted to be accessible while lifting them up to some of these concepts that are considered technical. Uh, for example, in chapter three, when I, when I define meaning and hermeneutics and context and, 
and you know grammatical historical interpretation and the hermeneutical triad and hermeneutical cycle all these things come out at the end stop stop talking like that don't make people think that this isn't a book for them because it is totally it is totally reachable yeah it is okay it is right that but that's not till the end so you'll get there (laughs) yeah yeah everything else is is leading to like hey this is i i did it purposely to write in, in very digestible you know punchy statements that are not yeah, intended yeah. to dumb it down to the average church member, but to get them excited. While I was writing this, I was getting excited. I'm reading scripture again, just while I was writing this, just kind of, a, you know, a, just refreshed in the word of God that just to go back to the basics, God really does exist. And he revealed himself in this massive library of literature that is radical in itself, just that concept. And I can actually grow my awareness of the living God as I'm reading his word, I mean, these things are just, they should always excite us. Yeah. And so I'm thinking of that. And so your question about the the person that's not a pastor, well, you know, I, I talked about this in, in chapter one, I believe, or maybe it's chapter two, but several years ago, Howard Hendricks came up with several reasons why people do not, most Christians do not read their Bible. And one of them was, they don't know what, they're not, uh, they're not professionally trained as a, as a clergy member. And they think that only a pastor or a priest or someone like that, or a theologian can read scriptures. And that's just not the case. Um, God revealed himself, and so therefore he wants us to understand him, at least at some point, or he wouldn't He wouldn't give us his holy scriptures. And so this book, I, I look at it as, yes, pastors being able to maybe bring some of these concepts to their people, but also in small groups and discipleship groups. Um, we call them life groups at my church, to be able to go through some of these pages, maybe a chapter or a meeting, and just talk about what the word of God is. And what does it mean to grow an awareness of God's presence through his scriptures? Those are ways that someone who's not academically trained or, or, cler- or trained as a clergy member might be able to use the book. That's great. And uh, you recommend some material at the end of the book of ways to dive deeper into this subject. So I was wondering if you could give uh, those who are watching this interview, maybe three or four of the top books that you would recommend on this subject. <laughs> See, you, you just hit me with a question I wasn't expecting. Now, <laughs> while I was writing the recommended resources, you'll notice I have an asterisk next to one that is more of a, a an entry accessible level, and then two asterisks for one that might be at a more intermediate to advanced level. And I, as I was compiling that thing, I thought it was, originally I planned it for it to be one page, maybe two pages, but more were coming up of, of different sources, resources that have helped me along the way as a student of scripture and as a professor as well. Um, and so it's hard to say what are my top three because it depends on what level we're talking about. Uh, but there are some, I, I guess for me, there, there are some perennial sources that are always helpful, always relevant. Um, I think of Roy Zook's basic Bible interpretation it's just a staple and good literal hermeneutics. Um, I'm also a big fan of Andreas Kostenberger, his inductive Bible study, him and uh, Richard Furr, as well as his hermeneutical triad. It's um, uh, Invitation of Biblical Interpretation. A lot of good stuff in there, but it's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's, I think the newest version is nine or a thousand, 900 pages to a thousand pages, something like that. So it's pretty big. That's a really good one. Um, but again, these are, these are hermeneutics book. So my book's a little bit different because I'm addressing biblical literacy and only tangentially speaking of hermeneutics to lead to biblical literacy. See, I, I think of biblical literacy as the bigger goal. Um, and so these other books that I recommend, they're more focused on hermeneutics, hermeneutic theory, um, a visual presentation of the history of the English Bible. That's one of the ones I have on there, those types of things, but nothing actually on biblical literacy itself. What does that even mean? Um, but those, those, those sources are in the back. I just, I, I'm a fan of each one of them. That's why I have them there. On a technical level, I love D.A. Carson's exegetical fallacies. Um, And when I read that book for the first time, I realized how many fallacies I commit (laughs) that I was committing up to that point in my sermon preaching or teaching or my own understanding of the Greek or something like that. Um, That one helped a lot. And, um, you know, I'm looking around my office. I'm like surrounded by so many of these books I have in that in that resource list. But there are just too many good ones to, and that's why I have it there. Those, those books are ones that I personally can vouch for. It doesn't mean I agree with every single one of them on every single page, but I think they are helpful for those who want to just grow that much more deeper in their love of scripture and their knowledge of it. Well, yeah, no, I think it's about 10 pages. Uh, I think it's 10 pages on my version of uh, different recommendations. So people and it should started out as just one or two, I think at the most, but it, it, it kept growing the more I thought about it. You know? <laughs> 
No, I think after reading your book, the one book that I'd read recently that I was glad that I read was uh, Robert Alter's The Art of Biblical Narrative, uh, because I think it just helps you to key in when you're reading those stories on the details and things that we often overmiss, overlook. And so um, that was one book that I was thinking about a lot while I was reading your book. And I think the two of those together will have a lot of impact on the series that I put out at my church, because uh, I think Alter's book just helps you read stories better, which yeah. is you know, what it's all about. So. Sure. Alter is fantastic because he he's hitting on sort of a 30,000 foot view of themes. Yeah. And that's so helpful when you're looking at the overall picture of these stories and the themes that are developing throughout scripture. So it really does. It matters. Like, do you want, do you want the 30,000 foot view or do you want the more analytical view? But you know what these resources do, Sean, they, they highlight the beauty of scripture there. Are, I mean, just the fact that it's not only is it the, you know, the, obviously the, the, the biggest selling book of the world, but all the books written on the Bible are the biggest selling books as well. I mean, this, <laughs> yeah. this is a treasure trove of literature that Hebrews tells us is living and active. You know, you can never exhaust scripture. You can never stop writing on it. So these sources are so helpful, but more are always being published each year that are that are worthy of consideration to help us understand uh, the Bible just a little bit better. Yeah, no. So thank you for the references in the back. It's it's a helpful list. I think it's a good collection of books that especially I think for probably the non seminary, just average Bible, um, a re- average church attendee, I should say, probably the reference works for the Bible in the last section, sort of those single volume dictionaries, background surveys, concordances. I think that section will probably be the most helpful if I would give any advice to somebody who looks at that and decides what they should get, because I always think that that type of information is is just so key in our understanding of the scripture. So when you got it, you got a great list of them, and I don't think anybody should feel like they need to collect all of them unless right. they have a huge uh, financial uh, li- ability right. to, to buy them all. But but a couple of them, I think, would be helpful for anybody uh, to just have that background information. For sure. And this is like a, you know, it's like a workshop. You Over time, you build up to these things. Yeah. And you, when you have, when the resources allow themselves, you, you pick up a new book, you know. And a lot of these are at library sales. A lot of them are, you know, here at SCS, at, at Southern California Seminary, where I teach. We have a library sale every year. And a lot of those books you can get for a quarter. <laughs> you know, you know, you can, you can come out with a box of books for a few bucks. And a lot of local seminaries and, and, and theological institutions will have those types of things. The biblically literate person to bring it back to that will want those sources to be able to just help them a little bit more and maybe maybe a little bit more attuned to these these sales that are happening and perhaps be a little bit more intentional if they're using logos software to look at sources that are that are coming in every month that are different or maybe the free book that month and and dive into it i mean these 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 are god has gifted the church for thousands of years of men and women that that can help us, you know, understand the scriptures just a little bit different, maybe perhaps from a different angle, something that my cultural bias kept me from seeing, whatever it may be. It's a good thing that we have so many published resources on the Bible. And yet, while I'm saying that, I'm thinking it's also a bad thing. You know, you can sort of get overwhelmed with yeah. all of these things. And there's a lot of bad sources out there. In fact, um, not to take up too much time on this, because I know we're, we're running short, but I talk about translations in the in the book. And America has this embarrassing amount of translations, and maybe we think translations are good because it gets them in the you get God's word in the vernacular. But you can have too much of a good thing, where the translations now are just bringing say dishonor to God's word, and it's actually inspiring laziness to not really understand the scriptures and just be dependent on the most toned down or culturally relevant translation, whatever whatever the reason may be, and it actually trivializes God's word. God's word does does deserve some hard work to understand. These Amen. Things. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. Uh, it was a great interview, great talk on understanding scripture, becoming proficient with it and remembering above all. And one of the things, and I love how you highlighted this, that our goal is not just simply to have a better head knowledge of this book. It's not just simply to collect the facts and information, but we become proficient in scripture so we can become aware of our God and who he is and his grace and compassion and mercy. And the more we learn about God directly from the scripture, the more we realize the most loving and compassionate person we will ever know is Jesus Christ and his father who sent him to earth. So uh, great, great reminder. Great thing. So, so thank you so much, Dr. Marsh for this time. I appreciate it. Oh, it was an honor for me, Sean. And I appreciate Rev Reads. I'm a big fan. So keep up the good work, sir.
All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. And if you are new to the channel and if this is your uh, one of your first exposures to Rev Reads, I would love for you to subscribe, uh, become a part of the groups that you can stay engaged in new books like Dr. Marsh's uh, that just came out. And I got some other brand new books that I'll be reviewing soon and talking to some other authors. And so I'd love for you to be part of the channel and what we have going on here. So thank you so much for watching.